How do the Buffalo Bills measure up to their rivals in the AFC East? We're comparing the offenses in the division today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout-out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, folks. Well, today and tomorrow on the podcast, we are going to focus in on comparing the Buffalo Bills to the rest of the AFC East. Today, we will focus on the offensive side of the football. Tomorrow will be defense, and we'll have the overall ranking of the four teams within the division. I'm very excited to do this. And later in the week, we're going to do the same thing, but apply it to the top contenders in the AFC. So the Bills versus the Chiefs and the Bengals. And so we'll get a good picture as to where the Bills stack up, at least in my opinion, entering the 2023 season. So today, AFC East offenses. Let me tell you about the methodology real quick here before we dive into the discussion. What I've done is I've went through and graded every single position group, quarterback, wide receiver, tight end, running back, offensive tackle, and interior offensive line. And I've graded what that team has on a scale of one to five. A five is perfect. It's elite starters. They have quality depth. A four is an excellent grade, quality starters in good depth. A three is average, a perfectly fine grade, average starters, okay depth. Two is below average, which is below average starters and okay to poor depth. And then a one is just, hey, simply not good enough in terms of what that team has at the position group. And then I've also went through and I've made sure that the premium positions are weighted more heavily. So quarterback, wide receiver, offensive tackle, the big pillars of an offense, those grades have a higher weight in my overall scoring than lesser positions in terms of premium value like interior offensive line, tight end, and running back. And so I've considered positional value and how these scores go. So it's not just a cumulative number of points. It's a percentage of points that's weighted based on positional value. All right, so let's do the thing that we want to get to, and that's the discussion on the Bills and where they match up against the rest of the AFC East. Of course, starting with the most important position in professional sports, quarterback. And the Bills obviously have Josh Allen, Kyle Allen. I grade that as a 4.75, Josh Allen, an elite starter. Kyle Allen, probably a replacement level backup, but Josh Allen, one of the three best quarterbacks in the NFL, he bumps that grade up to almost the perfect five. So a 4.75 there. For the Miami Dolphins, Tua to Vailoa, their starter, Mike White, now the backup in Miami. And given Tua's injury history dating back over the last several seasons, it's important for Miami to have a good backup quarterback, and I think they've acquired that in Mike White, a guy that uh, should be in position to take over for Tua at any point if necessary, given his familiarity in that Shanahan-style offense that Miami incorporates um, with Tua and, and, of course, you know with Mike McDaniel, their head coach. But Tua um, really had a great season last year um, when he was available. Uh, a lot of production with this quarterback-friendly scheme – really dynamic wide receivers in Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill. The real question for Tua and the Miami offense in general is, can Tua stay healthy? Because if he can stay healthy, this team, you know, I think has a legitimate shot here in the division and um, even a contender in the AFC. Um, but it's it's that element. He's got to stay healthy. But the other piece of this is, what's the evolution here, right? The, the Dolphins offense was really dynamic last year. But then later in the season, 
Um, they started to falter a little bit. And, you know, of course, Tua was hurt late, and so you're mindful of that. But even in Tua's last three or four starts, there was a bit of a dip there in what we saw from him earlier in the season against uh, some other teams. So interesting to see how this evolution happens, what the Dolphins have in terms of their counterpunch, and then what do defenses do to this offense after having a full year of tape to study it, right? I mean, it's a it's a challenging unit with Tua and his quick release and his accuracy uh, against two receivers in Waddle and Hill that can just get to spots uh, with, you know, incredible quickness. And so it's just tough to deal with. And I'm interested to see how it evolves. How do they incorporate the run game better uh, in 2023? How do they incorporate some of their ancillary weapons? Who's the third option in this passing game, right? So it'll be interesting to see how that comes together. I gave this a four. I really have a lot of respect for Tua, the season that he had uh, last year, how he's fitting into this offense. And they have a really good backup quarterback in Mike White in terms of backup quarterback. So I think this is a really good situation for them. It's all about staying healthy. It's all about evolving. Uh, The New York Jets, I don't know if you heard about this, but they have Aaron Rodgers now as their starting quarterback. That's a big deal. Um, Taking over for this mix of Mike White, Zach Wilson, and and Joe Flacco. I mean, that's, that's as big of an upgrade as as you can have, right? And I recognize that Aaron Rodgers didn't have his best season last year. He's going to turn 40 years old this year. Um, You know, I'm certainly mindful of that. But in terms of what he can elevate here at the most important position is big for the Jets. And we know that they have a good defense and some nice young players that we'll talk about here um, as we get to wide receiver and, and other spots. But, you know, Aaron Rodgers is such an upgrade for this team. Now, it's not bulletproof, right? I mean, I can absolutely see a world where, you know, Aaron Rodgers doesn't get things back on track. I know he uh, last year was obviously the worst season of his career. You can maybe point to uh, some issues with the supporting cast. Um, But the previous two years, he was the NFL MVP and played at an extremely high level. And so what does he look like this year in uh, with the Jets, right? There's not been a lot of uh, success there at the quarterback position. And it's, it's uh it's a tough place to play football, right? We see a lot of superstars across multiple sports go to this market and um they don't really play to the standard that they set previously. Again, Aaron Rodgers not his best season last year, turns 40. There's questions here, but obviously a, a big upgrade. If Aaron Rodgers is what he was last year, it's a big upgrade for this football team. I'm grading this as a 4.25. Their backup quarterback Zach Wilson uh give it a tick above uh what Miami has, but a tick below what the Bills have. The New England Patriots, uh, Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, the situation here. We'll see here. I'm not high on Mac Jones and never have been high on Mac Jones. Um, I think he's positioned to be a lot better this year. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to be too critical of, critical of Mac Jones. I mean, the Patriots did such a bad job last year with the coaching staff that they supported him with. Josh McDaniels goes to the Raiders, um, and they bring in like Matt Patricia and Joe Judge to run this offense, and it's an absolute joke, right? I mean. Just no identity, no plan. I mean, just awful. And Mac Jones in his second season just was not put in a good spot to play his best football. Now, I still think Mac Jones is a pretty limited player in, in his averages they come potentially. I, I mean, maybe he'll be an average to below average starter moving forward. And I think Bill O'Brien's arrival in New England will help uh, Mac Jones. But he's absolutely a tick below these other quarterbacks in the division. And, um, you know, I just don't think there's a lot of ceiling there to get excited about. So I give the Patriots quarterback – room a grade of a two and a half all right so it's bills 4.75 at quarterback jets 4.25 dolphins four and the patriots two and a half let's get to wide receiver the buffalo bills stefan diggs one of the top receivers in the entire nfl gabriel davis um who in the right role can can mean a lot to the offense deontay hardy trent Sherfield, khalil shakir uh as part of this unit um I think you really love, obviously, what you have in Stefan Diggs. Gabe Davis, I think, is an okay number two if you have the right slot player. Hopefully, the Bills do now in this uh, offense that now features the likes of Dalton Kincaid to go with Hardy and Sherfield and Shakir, right? You, you like to see that um, stabilize things and allow you to get more out of Gabriel Davis. And then you have a lot of versatility with Hardy, Sherfield, and Shakir, but you know, I think there's some questions about how that all comes together with Ken Dorsey and Josh Allen. I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm excited. Um, but there's, there's, there's question marks here. I think that's fair. Not that 
not that they don't have capable talent. It's about how does it come together? How do the Bills maximize it? I give it a 3.75 here uh, for the Bills. So uh, again, a, a grade of X, a four is excellent. Three is average. So I have it on the upper tier of slightly above average, if that makes sense. The Dolphins. Oh man, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddle. I mean, let's be honest. That's a nightmare to deal with. Unbelievable speed, unbelievable yards after catch. Both are great route runners. Both have really good hands. I mean, those, those two dudes are an absolute nightmare to deal with. Now I would say that there's questions after that. I mean, uh, Robbie Anderson or chosen Anderson or Robbie chosen, whatever the guy's name is, he comes over. Um, and he had a, a good season with the Panthers a few years ago, but he's over the last year and a half, two years has not really done much, but I do think in a vertical passing offense like the Dolphins have, this is a good spot for Robbie Anderson or whatever his name is. They signed Braxton Berrios, a slot player, um, most recently with the Jets, a punt returner and, and a guy that's a very traditional type slot player. And then Cedric Wilson is still in the mix as of the recording of this podcast. I know that they're looking to potentially trade him. They gave him a decent amount of money last year. Uh, to come in and be the number two receiver, but then they Tyreek Hill becomes available. Trent Sherfield kind of uh, claims that number three job, and so we'll see what happens with Cedric uh, Wilson. But let's be honest, this is about Tyreek Hill. This is about Jalen Waddle. Um, as good as a one-two in, in the NFL that you'll find, I give this a grade of a 4.75. The New York Jets, Garrett Wilson, uh, reigning rookie of the year, had an outstanding rookie season. And you consider how good he was last year with those three terrible quarterbacks. I mean, what's this guy going to look like with uh, Aaron Rodgers in his second season? I'm sure Jets fans are quite excited about that. They bring in a familiar, a uh, couple familiar names uh, from Aaron Rodgers' time in Green Bay, Alan Lazard, a big body. Think Gabe Davis type receiver uh, with Alan Lazard. Miko Hardman, the speedster from the Chiefs, comes over, uh, who's always been a little bit more. Um, excitement than he has been actual production. He's a very explosive player, but not a very consistent wide receiver. We'll see how he looks with the Jets. Uh, Corey Davis is still in the mix here, veteran player that uh, when he's healthy, he can be meaningful. And then, of course, Randall Cobb. Uh, I think this is a lot like the Bills wide receiver group in terms of its makeup. Diggs and Garrett Wilson, okay, you like what you have there. Davis and Lazard are pretty similar. A speedster and Hardman, a speedster and Hardy. Let's see what they look like. Um, some veteran depth. You know, it's it's very similar. I graded them exactly the same. Three point seven five for the Jets, like I gave the Bills. Let's get to the Patriots here. A uh, little bit different looking unit here. No more Jacoby Myers. They signed Juju Smith Schuster. Comes over from one season with the Chiefs to go with Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne. Tyquan Thornton, uh, Devontae Parker, big bodied possession style receiver, not much of a separation guy. Kendrick Bourne, I think, can be a nice ancillary component, but you would like to have better receivers on top of him uh, to be able to get the most out of him. And then Tyquan Thornton, second round pick from uh, last year, uh, very explosive guy, but really, really thin build. I mean, he's probably a one trick pony, like a uh, get down the field, nine route type guy. Um, you know, I don't know that they have a true number one receiver. You know, if they sign DeAndre Hopkins, and as of the recording of this podcast, they haven't, I think that would be helpful for them. Although it would kind of just give them another big bodied possession style receiver, but obviously the extremely good example of, of what that could be. Um, I just don't know that I look at this right now and I see, okay, we can funnel a lot of volume through any one of these guys and feel like we have a legitimate top option for our passing game. I know that they have a couple of good tight ends and Ramondre Stevenson, but. When you isolate the wide receiver core, I think this leaves something to be desired. I grade it as below average, um, but on the higher end of below average, 2.75 is my grade here because I do think that uh, Juju Smith-Schuster and Kendrick Bourne um, and, and even Devontae Parker can be nice pieces of a wide receiver core, and they're good, but like the absence of a true, legit number one guy here um, bumps that down, and, and you know, I don't... I, I think the absence of that type of player limits those types of players from being the best versions of themselves. So 2.75, my grade for the wide receivers. So the way it stacks up at wide receivers, I have the Dolphins at a 4.75, the Bills and Jets at a 3.75, and the Patriots at a 2.75. All right, we're going to get to tight ends and running backs here in just a moment. But first, I need to tell you about FanDuel. Make your way to FanDuel because right now, new customers – can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets 
if your first bet doesn't win, and I love betting over at FanDuel. They have great promotions every day. It's a safe, secure, and easy-to-use app. You get paid instantly, and you can get in on the football's futures bets right now. Super fun, whether it's over-unders for win totals projected for teams, player props when it comes to passing, rushing, receiving statistics, all the future awards, division winners, all of it is over there for you at FanDuel. Simply no better place to get in on all the action than America's number one sports book. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and get that no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, let's keep this moving here. We'll talk tight ends and running backs in this segment. The Bills at tight end, Dawson Knox, Dalton Kincaid, very excited for what this can be. You know, Dalton King, or excuse me, Dawson Knox, definitely uh, maybe a slightly above average starting NFL tight end. And Dalton Kincaid, obviously a lot of promise there. We've never seen him play in the NFL, but I feel really good about what he can be for this offense. I give the Bills tight end situation a three and a half. The Miami Dolphins, Durham Smythe, Eric Saubert, Tyler Croft is the group here. I think they got a bunch of backups. You know, I don't think they have a legitimate starter at the position. Uh, I think it's a better group than it was last year uh, with some of the depth that they've added in Eric Saubert and Tyler Croft is like just veterans can get in there and block and, and give you a baseline level of, of receiving skill, but nothing dynamic here. Uh, their lead guy, Durham Smythe, leaves a lot to be desired in terms of pass catching and even blocking. And um, I think this is just a below average unit. Uh, it's There's nothing exciting here. I, I thought they would do more at this position group this offseason. And they certainly added depth and they, they drafted Michael Wilson, who they're going to move to tight end. Uh, but just nothing that you look at from an opponent's perspective and say, man, that's going to be tough to deal with. I think this is below average. I grade it as a two. The Jets have a couple of really nice players. Uh, Tyler Conklin, who was productive last year for them, again, with some poor quarterback play and, and had a great uh, finish to his run in Minnesota. I think he's a quality starter. And then C.J. Uzoma, who uh, is a really, really quality number two. It's a, it's a nice situation, in my opinion, here. Um, you know, you haven't seen this type of depth and quality uh, for Aaron Rodgers at tight end yet, um, potentially throughout his career. But I like this group for them. I think it's four. I think it's an excellent situation. The Patriots have... Hunter Henry, who I think is a really solid starter. And then their backup now is Mike Gusecki, who is a meaningful catch point guy, size, straight line athleticism, but there's limitations there. I don't think you can use him as a traditional tight end. I think he's more of a move piece, flex him out, and there's some limitations. And I, I like Mike Gusecki in certain roles, but when you put Mike Gusecki with Juju Smith-Schuster and Kendrick Bourne and Devontae Parker and Hunter Henry, it's like, just more of the same, right? It's just nothing there in terms of dynamic, explosiveness, separation skills, anything like that. Like, who are the route winners here? You know, that's my question here overall. So I like Mike Gusecki. I don't know that I like him for the Patriots. Curious to see how that comes together. It is a pretty good situation, though. I mean, Hunter Henry and Mike Gusecki, there's, there's some promise there. I give that a 3.75. So when it comes to tight ends, I have the Jets at a 4, the Patriots at a 3.75, the Bills at a 3.5, could be a lot higher. We'll see what happens with Kincaid and then the Dolphins at a two. Let's get to running back now. The Bills have James Cook and Damian Harris. Of course, Naheem Hines, Latavius Murray. Good mix of receiving skill. There's speed there. There's veterans. There's downhill ability. There's pass blockers. I think this is overall just a very solid group. Now, obviously, the ceiling that James Cook can develop into will really move the needle here. But right now, we've only seen him in a complimentary role to Devin Singletary, some good flash, but we need to learn more about James Cook and what he is as more of a lead back in the NFL. I think this is really solid across the board, and I'm not sure there's anything elite here. Maybe there will be with James Cook. I give this a very solid three. The Dolphins are running it back with Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson. Maybe Dalvin Cook is on the way, um, and that is not reflected in this grade because as of the recording of this podcast, he is not on the Miami Dolphins. So it's Raheem Mostert, Jeff Wilson. They drafted Devin A-Chain um, this past year, who's a smaller back, but just really electric in terms of shiftiness and explosiveness. I'm sure he'll be a nice complimentary piece here and just gives them even more speed on offense. But Raheem Mostert came over last year and you know he, he had a good season for Miami, probably his best season of his career. 
He's battled injuries throughout his career. He had injuries last year, but he was fairly healthy. And when he was on the field, I thought he was a, a really solid starter for them. Just, I think more than anything, it was a lack of commitment to running the football for Miami that potentially took away from some of that production. They trade for Jeff Wilson, who's a nice complimentary piece, downhill physical runner. Uh, not a guy that's going to be a focal back for you, but a change of pace guy. I think it's solid. I give it a, a, a solid three here. The New York Jets, uh, Brees Hall, who was a rookie that they drafted, came in and had uh, a lot of success in, in a very brief early start to the season. And then the torn ACL, there's some questions about his availability early in the season next year. Um, and so, you know, obviously he showed so much promise, but, you know, we didn't see him last the season. We don't know what the the ceiling fully is here. So there's a lot to learn on Brees Hall. Michael Carter, uh, the backup here, um, we saw him look like Barry Sanders against the Bills in their win against the Jets last uh, against the Bills last year. But I think that's probably the best version of him that's ever existed. I think he's a solid number two. Uh, but there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot of upside. There's youth, uh, but a lot to learn. And one of my biggest questions about Brees Hall is, you know, how does he translate to a new style of offense? You know, it's going to be a lot different under uh, from Michael Lafleur, kind of a wide zone rushing offense, to Nathaniel Hackett, who's now their offensive coordinator. You know, I think he's going to have some different looks and different opportunities. And so there's going to be a bit of a transition there uh, as well for Brees Hall, who I thought was in a really good scheme for his skill set last year. I give this a three, and I think that might be a generous grade um, just because I, I do buy into the youth and the upside here. Uh, but there's a lot to prove here when it comes to this Jets running back situation. The New England Patriots have the best running back in the division. I don't think it's close for Andre Stevenson. Just an absolute monster, big physical runner that has speed, that can catch the football. You know, we've not seen New England under Bill Belichick very often commit to a guy as like a true lead back, a real volume ball carrier, but that's what they've done with Ramondre Stevenson. And I think that says a lot about Ramondre Stevenson. Really took took that job from Damian Harris and never really looked back. Uh, you know, like I said, the, be the best feature back in this division, and I don't think it's particularly close. Uh, they have some depth here. Ty Montgomery, who's been a veteran for a long time in the league, um, kind of a specialized player. Uh, Kevin Harris is there. Pierre Strong. They've got some young players, but it's all about Ramondre Stevenson. I give this a three and a half. So uh, the way that this stacks up is the Patriots get a three and a half, then the rest of the division get a three when it comes to the running back situation. All right, folks, after a very, very quick break, break we're going to talk about the offensive lines and then give you the final score here for the offenses in the AFC East. Stick with me. I'll be right back. All right, let's talk about these offensive lines, but first I would like to invite you to join the Locked On Bills subtext community, something fairly new that we're offering. It's been really fun so far. There is a link to join in the show notes for today. Uh, so if you're on YouTube or wherever you listen to the podcast, check out the notes. You'll see a link. Click on it, and you can join the Locked On Bill subtext community. Here's what you get. My favorite part is the one-on-one -on -one text conversations. I love this. Uh, going back and forth, um, listening to your takes, answering your questions, getting to know you better, hearing stories about your fandom, your favorite players, games that you've attended. That has been so cool. And then, obviously, I get to share more of myself as well. I've loved doing that. You get priority when it comes to herd mentality. We've had some exclusive content. My first reaction to all Bills news, all major Bills news, so if something happens with the Bills, the first thing I do when I see it is I send out a text to all of the subtext subscribers, and um, we've done some giveaways. It has been really, really cool. So check it out. Have some fun plans for the season, man. We're going to have a lot of fun with the subtext community uh, during the season. Uh, so check it out. Again, a link in today's show notes uh, if you're interested. And again, look, nothing changes with the normal delivery of this podcast. It's just an extra layer of engagement for anybody who might want it. And I'll tell you what, we're having a lot of fun. All right, let's get to the offensive tackle situation. I'll tell you what, what's interesting about this offensive tackle situation across the entire division is that it feels like everybody's got a, a nice answer at left tackle, quality starter there, and then really concerned about the right tackle situation. So let's work through it. Bill's is a great example of that. Deion Dawkins, high quality left tackle in the NFL. Spencer Brown, we'll see, right? He's got to put it together this year. I've, I've said that a thousand times that as big of anything for the Buffalo Bills in 2023 is Spencer Brown realizing his ceiling at right tackle. A lot of ability there. He's had a lot of setbacks and challenges throughout his career to this point, um, but we, we got a lot to learn about him. Does have two years of experience starting, which is good, uh, but I don't know that either season was 
tailored well for him to play his best football. I give this a three, and that's really elevating Deion Dawkins, being mindful of Spencer Brown and his ability, but also you have a nice depth piece now in Brandon Shell as a hedge against Spencer Brown. The Dolphins, Teron Armstead, one of the best left tackles in the game, does have a lot of injury concerns there. It seems like he misses a few games every single year and plays hurt a ton. Uh, but when he's on the field, he's a high-impact left tackle. And then a complete wild card in Austin Jackson, that right tackle. He only played – I don't think he played 100 snaps last year. He had an injury. He's had a really rough start to his career, and uh, he's trying to settle in at right tackle. Now, I think the, the good news for him is they have seemingly been committed to him, right? There's not like they went out and brought in a bunch of competition for him at right tackle. It looks like it's his job. Um, and, you know, like I said, for the, the Bills – uh, Austin Jackson realizing his ceiling this year for Miami would be huge for them. So look at it very similarly. Give this a three. I think Isaiah Wynn as a depth signing um, is a, is it was a great move for them. Could start at left guard, and then when if and when Teron Armstead gets injured, he can you know kick over to left tackle and uh, help minimize that drop off. Uh, so I give this a three. Give it an average grade. Again, heavily influenced by Teron Armstead. The Jets, um, this is a real interesting situation. Uh, Dwayne Brown, uh, older guy, veteran, um, solid left tackle. He's just really aging. You kind of wonder when the wheels fall off there. Um, Mikai Becton, the right tackle, again, just like Austin Jackson and Spencer Brown, you know, big question mark, big time question mark. He's, his issues have been different than uh, Spencer Brown, right? I mean, just not showing up in shape, uh, having injuries. Uh, it's been a rough go for him. And then they have some other guys, you know, that uh, could factor in here at tackle. Um, I'm concerned about tackle for the Jets, but also at the same time, I mean, if it comes together for Becton, I mean, he could be special, but I mean, his consistency has not been the name of the game for him. And Dwayne Brown can provide a, a nice high floor as a, as a left tackle. Um, but I, I still think that there's some question marks here, uh, bigger question marks than any other team. Honestly, I give this a 2.75. That gets us to the Patriots. Uh, Trent Brown, their left tackle, um, he had his worst season by far last year, switching from the right side. Um, and then just that offense in general was so out of sync and, and bad um, that it, I think it it made it hard for anybody to play good football, especially the offensive line uh, with Matt Patricia as your like Joe Judge. I, just a joke. It's an absolute joke what they did on offense. Uh, but I think he could play a lot better than he did last year. The right tackle, probably Riley Reef. I'm not very excited about Riley Reef. You know, I, I think you look at him last year with the Bears, and, you know, he couldn't really claim a job with that offensive line, and they really needed help, particularly at right tackle. Um, so we'll see. I think that, you know, he can come in and, if he's healthy, provide a decent floor here. Uh, they do have some intriguing depth here, but, um, you know, I think this is, this is a situation that, they need Trenton Brown and Riley Reef to to really kind of bounce back from what they showed last year. I'm giving it a three because there's a lot of experience here, a lot of reasons to believe it'll be better, but I'd be honest with you, I, that might be an aggressive grade. Uh, so offensive tackle, I have the Patriots, Bills, and Dolphins all at a three, and the Jets at a 2.75, which gets us to the last position group, which is the interior offensive line. I think the Bills uh, here with Connor McGovern, Mitch Morse, Ryan Bates as your projected starters. Good depth in David Edwards, a young player in Osiris Torrance. Uh, Mitch Morse, uh, one of the better centers in the game. Um, Connor McGovern, who I think is a sufficient level starting left guard. And then kind of the same thing with Ryan Bates. So high quality center, two sufficient level starters at guard. That's a three and a half for me. The Dolphins, uh, Connor Williams is their center. And man, what a great story that was last year comes over from Dallas, never played center before, steps into this offense and was an impact starter all season long. Uh, I think he's rock solid. And then Robert Hunt at right guard is a really high quality player as well, a quality starter. And then Isaiah Wynn, now the left guard, uh, that'll be a new spot for him. But I, I think that's a better spot for him than where New England was playing him on the right side last year. Um, and so I think that has the potential to be a, a solid middle of that offensive line. Again, really heavily influenced by Connor Williams and Robert Hunt. I give that a 3.75. The Jets, um, Connor McGovern back at center. They also drafted Joe Tipman, one of my favorite centers from the draft. Elijah Vera Tucker is back and healthy at one guard spot. And then Lakin Tomlinson, the other guard. I think Tomlinson, 
um, you know, he they gave him a good amount of money to come over from San Francisco, and he didn't play his best football last year. So they're counting on him in year two to settle in and, and be more consistent. I think we know what Connor McGovern is. Joe Tittman's a nice young player. And then Elijah Vera Tucker, you know, injury setback last year, but when he's been healthy, he looks like he's going to be a quality starter. Um, but I think the left guard spot here with Tomlinson is where you get a little bit concerned. And then, you know, McGovern, you know, what's left in the tank here? I give this a three and a half. I think it is serviceable, but there's there's some questions here. Gets us to the Patriots. Uh, Cole Strange, their first round pick from last year, settled in late in the season and, and I thought really stabilized his play. Looks like he'll be a, a good starter for them. David Andrews has been a fixture there for a number of years at center. He's a, st- a quality player. And then Michael and Wayne Yu might be the best interior offensive lineman or the best guard. We'll call it guard because uh, I don't, I don't want to get into the center dynamics of Mitch Morse and Connor Williams, but he's the best guard in the division. And, um, you know, even with all the garbage that was going on with the Patriots offense last year, Michael and Wayne, you found a way to play good football. Um, and I think he's, he's really solid. So a uh, high ceiling player there and, and Wayne, you rock solid starting center and David Andrews, uh, a first round pick that showed great growth last year in Cole strange. Uh, this is, this is good looking interior offensive line for the Patriots. I give that a 3.75. All right. So like I mentioned at the beginning, I've went through and, assigned weighted positional value to each position. And so I have final scores here. And the way that I got to these final scores is by taking the percentage of possible points. So every position you can get up to five points. So what percentage of possible points did you get? And then how does that position group weigh into the overall value? So like, for example, quarterback, I have like 35% of the grade here is quarterback. And then I think 25% or 20% is offensive tackle and wide receiver. And then like, you know, low, lesser positions have a lower percentage of the overall pie here, which I thought was the right way to do this. So when it's all said and done, the bills do have uh, the number one offense entering the season with a, uh, with getting 76% of the available points here in this exercise, you know, having Josh Allen uh, as the clear best wide receiver, or excuse me, quarterback in the division, I think really, um, really helps that that grade a ton. Um, the Dolphins and Jets, I actually have tied at number two. They got 73% of the available points, and then the Patriots got 60% of the available, available points on offense. So Bills 76%, Dolphins, Jets 73%, Patriots 60%. We're going to do the same thing tomorrow, but on the defensive side of the football, and then at the end of it, I'll have an overall grade that factors in offense and defense. So we'll go through all the defense tomorrow. And then of course, averaging the defense with the offense to give the overall grade of uh, each team entering the 2023 season uh, as things stand today and through the lens of my personal opinion. Hope you enjoyed this. Looking forward to the defense tomorrow. So make sure that you come on back, make sure you're subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate review and share the podcast Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.